right, we are here today with Matt Posel, who is an internal communications manager in strategic communications for the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation in Kansas City, where he supports associates' understanding of the foundation's history, mission, priorities, and impact goals. He serves as an important thought partner for senior leadership, providing useful and compelling content that reinforces the foundation's messages, furthers program goals, and connects with key audiences. He joined the Kaufman Foundation in 1998 and has more than 20 years of experience as a communications professional. Matt, thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for the invitation. Happy to be here. Well, I've mentioned to you in our lead up to this that um, I knew about Ewing Kaufman being from the Midwest and the Kaufman Foundation has supported Iowa State University in developing entrepreneurship programs among many other places. But what I thought I would do for our conversation today is dive into a few different decisions that Kaufman made over the course of his career and sort of see where the conversation takes us. And so I wrote the case study about uh, Kaufman both getting into Major League Baseball franchise ownership with the Kansas City Royals in the late 1960s, uh, perhaps a much more expensive <laughs> endeavor that he ever anticipated, but, but one that is still with us. I'm sure much to the uh, continued pleasure of people in Kansas City and baseball fans everywhere. But in the early 1970s, he decided to do an experiment kind of outside of the normal channels of how baseball was done and really still is done today called the Kansas City uh, Royals Baseball Academy. Could you give us kind of the background on what led to that decision to start something that was, you know, another significant investment on top of what it took to start up the Royals as a baseball franchise? Sure. Well, um, I think you've hit on one of my, my favorite stories. I mean, I, 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 you know, it's a fun story to tell. I love baseball. And uh, I think uh, Ewing Kaufman's approach is was so different in a business or a, uh, a structure that was very hidebound and uh, sort of resistant to change at a lot of levels. Um, I think Ewing Kaufman, he, he sort of came to baseball um, um, by happenstance. I mean, Kansas City lost their team to Oakland. Uh, they had an owner before uh, of the of the uh, Kansas City Athletics who was pretty flamboyant. He was a salesman himself and uh, a big promoter. And he uh, sort of dangled the baseball franchise out to other cities before he eventually uh, did leave Kansas City for Oakland. So we lost our baseball team, which was important to Kansas City. Um, you know, Kansas City had a big baseball heritage, the Kansas City Blues at, at the minor league level. And then, the, uh, of course, the Kansas City Monarchs, who sort of ruled uh, Negro Leagues baseball. We have the Negro, we're home to the Negro Leagues Museum here in Kansas City. Buck O'Neill, um, uh, uh, Satchel Paige, and some of the greatest players in the Negro Leagues came through Kansas City. So we knew what good baseball looked like, and the A's never provided it here. They never even had a winning record in all of their years. So um, it wasn't a great loss to lose the team, but um, there was something missing. And so the city, you know, put out the uh, question, if there's anybody here that could convince Major League Baseball that we have someone local who had the wherewithal and the interest uh, to uh, support a team. And Mr. Kaufman, you know, stepped to the plate and, uh, uh showed that he was willing and able to do that uh, the more he got into it the more i think it captured his imagination to be a baseball team owner he actually flew to all the owners uh the other owners to uh convince him convince them to vote for him a, a, sa a salesman always <laughs> <laughs> couldn't resist so um and then he did uh win the franchise and establish the kansas city royals now to your point, Kevin, I think as an entrepreneur, you know, if he was going to be a baseball owner, which was never really his dream, but it was something that he fell into, um, he was going to do it his way. And uh, so I think when we tell the baseball story from beginning to end, um, it really demonstrates some of the qualities, his curious nature, his innovative spirit his uh, uh, restlessness to, to an extent and his um, his ability to make 
to do bold things and to convince others that, you know, this could work um, without being reckless, uh, without being crazy. Um, you know, I think many of the things that were launched at the Baseball Academy were, as you know, so well researched. I mean, he brought people in from NASA. He brought uh, doctors in to test eyesight and things. So, you know, it was research based um, calculated risks to go forward with this bold idea. So the idea itself was um, pretty simple. It was, you know, what if we knew more about the techniques, the, the, the physical qualities, the mental qualities that add up to a good baseball player? Um, and then how can we break down the techniques, the individual skills of hitting, throwing, fielding, um, that base running that make up a good baseball performance. And what if we just found stellar athletes who had those physical qualities or mental cap capabilities, and maybe we could teach them the techniques to be a good baseball player. Didn't have to play, ever have played baseball, but maybe you were a javelin thrower in high school. Maybe you were a wrestler. Maybe you know, you played basketball or football or something. Maybe you played a little bit of baseball, but not to the point where you were playing on your high school team or a place where conventional baseball scouts will have seen you play and have you on um, the radar, if you will, for professional baseball, for draft and such. So these would be uh, sort of the hidden gems who are out there who nobody else was seeing the potential in. And Ewing Kaufman and his his team of, uh, you know, we've called them uh, Mavericks because, I mean, Ewing Kaufman had this spirit, but then there was a small group of people that he brought in, some of them from other, you know, he was sort of enamored with the California Angels uh, franchise, Gene Autry and what he had done out there. And so he, he you know, enticed some of his executives to come join the Royals. And, um, you know, I think they were anxious to try something different too. And so the baseball Academy became real. Um, it was in Florida. It was like 120 some acres, five uh, baseball diamonds that were the exact dimensions of Royal stadium in Kansas city, now Kauffman stadium. Um, and they had tryouts, thousands of people around the country they sent scouts out. Now, before they did this, they did research into the 150 or so players that were on the Royals, either at the major league level or the various minor league levels. And they tested their eyesight, reflexes, foot speed. Um, they did uh, intelligence tests. How well do they recognize things, remember things? Um, so it was, they had a pretty a strong physical and mental uh, breakdown of what these guys who made it into professional baseball at some level possessed. Uh, so they had a, uh, that was their uh, uh, standard that they would then judge these, these kids at tryouts. Um, they also had uh, probably the most famous celebrity. Uh, Ted Williams was uh, enamored with the idea of studying the science of baseball and so he visited the academy and uh he was going to stay for a day and he ended up staying there for three days and while he was there they did all the testing on ted williams i mean what is his eyesight i mean he famously you know had amazing eyesight and reflexes and everything else could see the see the seams on the baseball as it was traveling at him at 90 miles an hour <laughs> yeah, like it was a beach ball or something so you know he um you know, so now they have added to this research mix something that could produce the next Ted Williams, you know? So they, uh, from all the tryouts, then they 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 brought it down to, I think, 40-some uh, young athletes. And again, some of them have ne had never played organized baseball, you know? Uh, so they brought them to the academy. Um, they were in dorms, like a college dorm, and it was it was all baseball. 
uh, except for the opportunity to attend uh, Manatee uh, Junior College. So Mr. Kaufman was pretty adamant about the idea that, um, you know, he wasn't just going to develop baseball players, he was going to develop people. And these kids were were young kids. And, and so to provide them some education was important. Um, the odds that they would make the major leagues and have a lucrative professional career were low. And he understood that, even though he was hoping, certainly for each one of them, that they would make that. He understood that probably wasn't in the cards. Yeah. And so you're right. And then, and if they did make it to the major leagues, um, you know, we've all heard stories about fortunes lost and not understanding uh, some basic uh, financial literacy things. And so he wanted to provide that as well. But aside from those classroom settings, it was all baseball and uh, nothing but baseball. And so they, they had drills, you know, there's a long list of innovations that uh, were featured. Uh, I actually wrote some of them down that. Well, weightlifting, you know, was, was one of them, which I think for people today are like, well, of course, if you want to be a refined athlete, you're going to lift weights. But in the late 1960s and early 1970s, that was actually an extremely controversial opinion, or I would even say, not just in baseball, but in other sports, it was more that athletes would become muscle bound and wouldn't be able to run because another team that I'm a fan of is the Nebraska Cornhuskers. And I grew up in Nebraska, but the coach back then, Bob Devaney, had had a couple of bad seasons in the 1960s and was trying to figure out what to do differently and had somebody who'd been a gymnast of all things at the University of Nebraska who after an injury prone gymnastics career that started lifting weights. And all of a sudden this guy, whose name is Boyd Epley could bench press 400 and some pounds. And he was stronger than the almost 300 pound lineman that coach Devaney had. And he said, you know, maybe there's something to this weightlifting. And so Boyd Epley developed what was one of the first collegiate football weightlifting programs at the same time, essentially Ewing Kaufman was doing the same as part, not all, but, part of the training for these people in the academy. Yeah, and I think at some point, weightlifting turned into uh, strength training. And I think that's a key difference because it was building strength where it was needed the most. Um, and stretching is another, I mean, it seems silly to say that, hey, you know, how about we try stretching, you know? But again, Flexibility might be important. Yes, yes. And uh Rehabilitation methods, you know, using a, a swimming pool to run in the swimming pool so you don't have, you know, the jarring effect of, but you still get the resistance of the water. Um, they used, uh, they actually cut up old uh, uh, inner tubes from tires and used those as as bands to strengthen arms. And and they, they attached one to a bat. So when you swung a bat, you had more resistance. Again, you know, you go into any, you know, gym, fitness facility, uh, and you'll see all this these this equipment now that uh, was sort of uh, introduced uh, at the academy for the ball players. And you know, this is a point that I make about Ewing Kaufman, whether it's business or baseball or philanthropy. The innovations that he introduced and his team of associates at the academy or Marion Labs or now at the Kaufman Foundation they have stood the test of time. They, they caught on and you forget the first person who did this because now everybody does it. And so when they become conventional, to me, that's the true definition of an innovation. When it changes the way, in this case, baseball players prepared for their sport. Um, and now you see it all the time. They had videotape uh, for the first time now you go to a ball game and you see players on tablets between at bats watching their previous at bats or watching their history against this pitcher. Um, so videotape equipment, radar guns, uh, something as simple as a stopwatch to time the pitchers, how long the pitcher takes to deliver the ball to the plate, how long the catcher takes to throw the ball to second base, and then adjusting the lead that the runner has at first base accordingly was all done at the academy and now you see every first baseman in major league baseball has a stopwatch 
with them uh, to do the same thing. Um, Charlie Finley, the flashy sales guy, insurance salesman who owned the Kansas City Athletics, is sometimes thought as a great creative innovator. I mean, he had a he had a mechanical rabbit that brought the balls to the umpire that popped up from the ground, which is very cute. And he was a big proponent of changing uh, the baseballs to orange baseballs. Um, he thought they'd be more visible or whatever. And so the difference between that kind of innovation and the Ewing Kaufman innovation is, you know, the Royals are playing the Chicago Cubs today. The baseball is not going to be orange. There's not going to be a mechanical rabbit popping up from the ground, but the players are going to stretch. There's going to be videotaping. There's going to be stopwatches. There's going to be radar guns. Uh, all of these things that were commonplace and introduced at the academy have now caught on. So, the, I, you know, in my mind, those are the true innovations. Well, to your point, you know, entrepreneurs do what they do, no matter the context. So he had done it in business. <laughs> he did it eventually in philanthropy, but he did it in baseball. Yeah. And I don't know if baseball really saw this coming. And, you know, to be to be fair, there were a lot of old baseball guys on the Royal staff who were were not on board with what was going on. Uh, now, they did not. I, I think it's important to know they did not forsake the traditional scouting. They were still scouting players. They were still signing players that way. So at the same time, they were developing uh, Frank White at the Baseball Academy, who would go on to become one of the all-time great Kansas City Royals. They drafted uh, in 1971 George Brett, who would uh, uh, play alongside, play with uh, Frank White in the infield during the glory years of the Kansas City Royals. So they were making smart draft choices. They were making smart trades. Uh, they trade for Amos Otis from the Mets. They traded for Fr Freddie Patek from the Pirates. John Mayberry from the Astros. So they built the team in traditional ways through the draft but and trades, and then um, also the players that were coming up through the academy. Mm -hmm. um, I would just, for, base, for, for big baseball fans, some of the other things that, you know, I, I read Sid Thrift's book, and Sid Thrift was the guy that Ewing Kaufman selected to run the academy. He was the director of the academy. Sid is a true character in every sense of the word. Um, interestingly, one of his sons, their second sons for Sid and his wife, Dolly, had uh, they noticed that he was having trouble developing as an infant and he wasn't developing the same way as his older brother. So they took him to doctors and found that he had uh, 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 brain uh, uh, damage uh, as a result of uh, not having enough ox oxygen during the uh, delivery. So then they were, uh, uh, Sid Thrift and his wife went on this crusade to find out what they could do to try to help him develop as much as he could. Um, and, you know, crawling and creeping and eventually walking and doing the normal uh, physical things, mental things. And so they learned of a, t of a technique called patterning, pat patterning. So you take a mm -hmm. pattern and you repeat it. Um, they also worked on his fine motor skills, picking up coins and, um, you know, basic skills for emotional, mental, physical development. And so he was sort of breaking down physicality of the human, you know, body, which he then applied what he learned from his son and working with his son. I mean, his son eventually was able to live a uh, a life of his own he had a job he could he could drive and things so um they brought him along as as far as they could but you know that same passion about breaking down the physicality in terms of baseball uh is what sid thrift applied when he got to the academy um they also developed the two strike hitting approach where when you have two strikes you move a little bit closer to the plate because ten, the pitcher they had done the research that said the pitcher is probably going to pitch outside. So you want to move closer to the plate, maybe choke up on the bat, um, widen your stance and look for an outside pitch, 45 degree bunting angle. You watch people bunt today. Now this it's, you know, not everybody is, has, is on board with this, but instead of holding the bat horizontally, there's a 45 degree angle. 
because in their research you were less likely to pop up if the bat handle if the bat it was was at an angle. At an angle. Uh, again, they timed and measured base runners. Um, they also the difference between a two seam and a four seam fastball, which is in pitchers' repertoire now, and there is a difference how you hold the baseball. And they calculated it could make a difference between four and five miles an hour, which is pretty huge when you're trying to hit a baseball coming at you. So um, those are some of the, you know, techniques that they then worked on with with the players. Um, and so, yeah, brought a tremendous amount of innovation. Uh, yeah, brought on a player like Frank White, who played alongside uh you know, other great players for that 1985 World Series win, you know, getting to the, the pinnacle of the sport that Mr. Kaufman had always dreamt of, you know, but three years in, ultimately decided to close it down. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, Frank White was the star pupil. I mean, he did go on and he was, you know, there were other players, uh, Ron Washington, who now is one of the coaches at the Atlanta Braves, and you all Washington, who played shortstop eventually with the Royals. Uh, uh, Frank White is in the Royals Hall of Fame. He, he, in our view, should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. But his numbers retired along with George Brett, Dick Hauser, and uh, Jackie Robinson. And there's a statue of Frank White uh, in the outfield. There's also a statue of Mr. and Mrs. Kaufman at Kaufman Stadium. So, um, yeah, so part of what happened with the Academy was uh, baseball economics. Uh, you know, I think Ewing Kaufman, now, you know, you said earlier, I think, I think Ewing Kaufman went into this baseball ownership with his eyes open and thought, you know, this isn't going to be a moneymaker. I mean, I'm doing this in many ways. It was his introduction to giving back to the city that he loved and grew up in and made his fortune beyond his wildest dreams. So he said, you know, when he got the franchise, he said, you know, base, or Kansas City's been been so good to me, I wanted to show that I could return the favor. And so that's sort of the way he approached it. But yeah, baseball economics and running the conventional scouting program alongside the academy at the same time they were trying to build a new baseball stadium in Kansas City. Um, there was a labor dispute during that construction. So construction was delayed for a year. It was supposed to open in 1972. They weren't going to be able to open for another season. Mr. Kaufman ended up putting more of his own money in to try to make up the difference. Um, interestingly, uh, they were set to host the All-Star, the Major League All-Star game in April of that, or not April, but uh, July, I guess. So July, they yeah. had uh, something like the 52nd game ever played at Royal Stadium was the All-Star game. So there was a there was a certain urgency to get the stadium done. So all of those things conspired. And as as we talked about earlier, you know, some of his own baseball people were in his ear saying, this is crazy. This isn't working. This is just, you know, we're draining money. This isn't going to work out. Uh, so he did make the difficult decision to close down that part of the Royals player development. Uh, but also expressed at the end of his life that it was one of his biggest regrets. <laughs> which is something else for somebody like him to say. Yeah. And you think when you think about it, how much more would they have learned as they move forward with more and more players? And, you know, I mean, there's, there's something about Frank White that there's a version of that in UL Washington. There's a version of Ron Washington. You know, many of the guys that went to the, there was a, player at the academy uh how baird uh he was in the first class he went on to coach the uh auburn university baseball team so mm -hmm. frank thomas and bo jackson were were some of his players down there and so he made his mark in in managing and coaching and there's other examples of people who had been part of the academy either as an instructor or a one of the student one of the students one of the players who went on to be coaches or trainers or um, in, the, in that capacity in baseball. So the impact completely disproportionate to kind of the time that it 
was there. I mean, that that's amazing. But, you know, I think the lesson for an entrepreneur today is, you know, especially when people talk about the war for talent and, you know, we're in a low unemployment time, you know, which is, is good from an economic perspective. But, you know, if you're trying to build teams, it's hard to find talent. Well, to take inspiration from Mr. Kaufman, uh, you know, look where others aren't and then put a lot of resources into developing that talent, no matter where it comes from. Yeah. And I think he showed, you know, from the start, it's funny because as we look back through the years, we'll find old Sports Illustrated articles or old Sporting News articles. And the small article will say, you know, before the Royals, you know, when they first were established, they were the first baseball, Major League Baseball team to provide health insurance and profit sharing for the front office staff, which is incredible. Uh, but, you know, he did that at Marion Lab, so he was going to do that in baseball. And I think that was another thing that committed people to him. Uh, people wanted to give more uh, because he gave so much and uh, he treated people really well, he respected people. Um, he also went with such vigor into things. Once he decided this baseball thing was going to happen, he was going to put as much energy and uh, zest in it as he did anything else. And one of the things he did was like, once they had some players, they hadn't played a game yet, but he put them on buses and he sent them all over the Midwest. Because when you, when you look at the first programs for the Royals, there's a image that shows Kansas City in the middle and then this big circle all around. It goes into Colorado. At that time, there was no Rockies team down into Oklahoma City and Tulsa, halfway across Missouri. St. Louis had the other half, but we'll take this half uh, up into Iowa, Lincoln, your country, you know, and it was important to capture fans. He understood that he was in one of the smallest markets in baseball, but he needed to draw from a bigger region. So he sent players on buses to all these different, to Goodland, Kansas, and to Dodge City to meet people before they played a game. And so again, small sporting news article, before the Royals played their first game, they set a record for season ticket sales in the American League. They sold over 7,000 season tickets. So, and Mr. Kaufman recruited his sales team from Marion Labs, put blue jackets on them, <laughs> sent them out to sell tickets with the reward that they and their spouse could go to spring training if they sold a certain amount of tickets. So it it was, I think, fun for Kansas City and uh, a new energy obviously was put into, into the team. Yeah, and maybe I'll use that, Matt, as a segue into Marion Laboratories to talk a little bit about that. If we zoom further back in time, uh, Kaufman had been a very successful salesperson in the pharmaceutical industry, but made the decision in 1950 to um, start his own business. And, you know, people should understand he was starting a pharmaceutical business. He was not a trained scientist. He had been in the pharmaceutical business, of course, but as a salesperson, he had his associate's degree in business from a community college. He was clearly a very smart guy, but it was a pretty bold decision at the time. But in my reading of it, at least, a lot of his motivation for doing it was uh, displeasure for how he had been treated and a fundamental philosophy for how he wanted to treat people that he worked with. Am I thinking about that the right way? And could you help us a little bit with some of the details of that founding of Marion Laboratories? <laughs> well, I feel like you sh I should hand over the historian, you know, <laughs> plaque to you because that's that's a very succinct way. Yeah, he was not treated well. So he he gets out of the Navy. He's like, I need to get a job. Um, he um, sees an ad for pharmaceutical sales. Now, he did try sales before. Uh, he tried selling insurance in, in Kansas. And he actually, he was dating a girl and her, her, her dad sort of got him uh, this job. And so he went through training and stuff. He didn't believe in the product. Did, he didn't do well. He's like, this isn't for me. Fun fact, uh, years later, when he did save up enough money, 
he sent a check to that company for the training that they had provided for him <laughs> because he felt bad that it, you know, it didn't take. So anyway, he, he finds this ad and what intrigued him wasn't that it was pharmaceutical or sales or anything, but there was a test that they were going to give for the employment, for the interview. And he like loved taking tests. He goes, I'm going to take this test, took the test, uh, did well, took the job with just straight commission. No, no salary. No just, salary. Yep, just commission. Turns out he was a remarkable salesman when he had the right product that he believed in. And he made more money just on straight commission than the president of the company. Well, that doesn't happen. And so they cut his uh, sales commission rate. Uh, so he like sucked it up and he thought, okay, well, that's not gonna deter me. He went out, even with this lower commission rate, made more money again than the president of the company, and they cut his sales territory. So two years in a row, he was not rewarded for producing. And that was enough for him to go to some of the doctors that he was selling to and said, hey, you know, would you buy from me if I started my own venture? And enough of them said yes. He had some money left over from winning poker games in the Navy. And he put that to the business. Um, it's funny. He asked some people to to invest. Uh, there are some stories of people who passed on that opportunity and <laughs> lived to regret it. But boy, uh, did they miss out! Yeah, <laughs> and started the business uh, from his home, uh, the basement of his home, a pretty modest home, not too far from where I am now. Um, he uh, uh, called it Marion Labs. He wanted to call it Kaufman Labs, but he didn't want to go to a doctor and say, I'm Ewing Kaufman from Kaufman Labs. It was, he used his middle name, Marion, and then it would seem like, and I, I, I'm not an entrepreneur, but I think one of the principles is you sort of fake it until you make it. And he was faking like he had a whole laboratory behind him uh, where all he really had was a modest house. And, so, and, uh, and, a, and a bench in his basement, definitely not a laboratory. So aspirational name. <laughs> and I think- I want to dispel one of the folklores that you hear about. He he wasn't like crushing oyster shells in his basement to make pills. He was ordering pills in bulk from St. Louis. Trucks would come in, they would, you know, drop off the and then he would put he would put pills in the bottle, type out the label, send them to the doctor, and then go make the sales the next day. After a year, the neighbors were complaining about these big trucks coming through. And so he moved to an office, again, on Troost Avenue, which is just behind us on the property that the Kauffman Foundation sits on. Troost Avenue is on on our uh, east side here. So, um, yeah, you know, great American success story. I mean, he was a he was a poor kid. I mean, he he's a, he did not grow up with mean means. Um, his mom used to tell him. When he went to school, you know, there's going to be kids with more money than you, but nobody's better than you. Um, he developed habits as a child that served him for all of his life. And uh, can I tell one story about his childhood? That please, please. This is he. He when he was 11 years old, he had a heart problem, and his uh, there wasn't medication or surgery to do, and so they were like, he needs to rest in bed for a year one year not run around and things so he's 11 year old boy so that's tough and then his mom who was who had a college degree um said she was concerned he was going to fall back in school so she brought him books she went to the library and bought him books and brought him books he became a ferocious reader and that habit extended throughout his life later he said that was the most important year of his life because it opened him up to a world that a poor kid in Kansas City, Missouri would never have experienced. And so, and he, he read everything. It wasn't like business journals or pharmaceutical. Yeah, he read those things, but he read for pleasure and he read bio biographies of the presidents. And, and you know, that habit of reading, I, I think he had a curiosity about everything. And and if there's a common if there's a common characteristic across entrepreneurs in my observation it is Matt what you just mentioned and that's curiosity and you mentioned you'd listen to my episode about deer and 
So he's left us some things, but he's far enough back in history, not a whole bunch. But what you know, we know for sure is that he had a very extensive library. And so he had much less education than Ewing Kaufman. But again, that curiosity kind of kind of drove him. You know, as you um, told the story of him being mistreated at his first company because he's making more than the president, and we can't have that. I flash back to my second company, and I remember as it started to grow, I did have a little bit of a base salary for our salespeople, but it was heavily commissioned. And I remember when I finally started to write paychecks to my salespeople on a monthly basis that were bigger than mine. And that was a really happy day. If you think about it the right way, that means your company is succeeding. And, you know, and I was an owner, so maybe that's a more natural way to look at it. But what a what a fail by Kaufman's boss, but what a, a good thing for the rest of the world. The principle, the two principles are treat others as you want to be treated, share the rewards with those that produce. Those were for real. I mean, I've talked to enough people, Kevin, that, that you know, and there were times when they got taken advantage of because not everybody, not everybody is a treat others as you want to be treated person. And he knew that. I mean, he said that. We have interviews where he goes, yeah, you know, people are going to take advantage of you, but in the long run, it's going to serve you well. Short term, maybe, you know, someone will be unscrupulous or something, but, and then the share the rewards with those who produce was a real thing as well. And, you know, people on the line who put pills in bottles, maybe not the exact same way he did, but they did the same thing he did when Marion Labs went public and they had stock. They famously, 300 people in Kansas City that day became millionaires. And they weren't the all the executive people. They were the, the men and women, mostly women, who worked on the assembly line. So, cool. Yeah, and he famously referred to people that worked at his company never, ever as employees, but as associates. Um, yeah, he had a kind way of saying, you know, look, uh, I... I don't, you know, I don't want to manage you. I don't want to employ you, but I do want to be associated with you. And it's funny when you were, I I resisted the urge to stop you or say at the end, after you were introducing me and all of these, whatever my title is and things, I really consider my title as associate to be the most precious thing. And we're all associates here. And to me, it brings us all closer to, you know, what you and Kaufman the relationship that he wanted for the people that had a stake in uh, his business, his baseball or his philanthropy. And it's it's funny, and I'm sure around the halls of the Kaufman Foundation, it's this way. But Matt, I've observed this around Kansas City with um, people who don't work at the Kaufman Foundation, who were born after Kaufman died in the 1990s, but they still refer to him as Mr. K. <laughs> Where is that coming? Where is that coming from in your observation? Well, I don't know. He's a, well, you know, he's a charming guy. And he's, I think one of the, so I wish more entrepreneurs, uh, and especially if they're going to launch into philanthropy, would have taken the time or will take the time to sit down and record um, their life and times, aspirations, hopes, dreams, you know, expectations, the way Mr. Kaufman did. Now, I understand he was a little bit, he had to be convinced to sit down and tell his story. But the most valuable piece we have is seven or eight hours of videotape conversation of Ewing Kaufman talking about all of the things. And I'm confident that I can say some of these things that we're talking about because we have him talking about it himself. Um, and it gave us a guidepost to move forward with his philanthropy. Unfortunately, he recorded that near the end of his life, and he was he was ill. Um, he had some really difficult days near the end of his life. He died of uh, of bone cancer, and it really ravaged his his body, and it robbed him of his charisma and charm. And I think we don't get to see that as often. Now we have unearthed some really great pieces. If you go to the web, if, if you go to Kaufman.org, our website, my favorite is an interview um, that he did 
uh, for the Jeannie Palmer show. It's in black and white. And she is, uh, I, I don't know if it's a finance company or insurance company or something, but it was sort of a, uh, it, it was sort of a close, I, I don't know what it, it was a produced thing by a company where she talked to business leaders much the way you do. And uh, it, it's, it's hilarious, but you can tell every bit of his charisma, every bit of his charm comes through and his passion. He says during that interview, Kevin, that he believed it's the unalienable right of every person that works for the company to own a piece of the company. I mean, he is in no uncertain terms talking about sharing the rewards. And then, and that's also where he says about some people will take advantage of you, but that shouldn't, uh, um, you know, dissuade you from. It shouldn't stop you. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Well, maybe we'll use the mention of that and, and his philanthropy to talk about the third decision that I want. And that was ultimately to leave an endowment that is today the Kaufman Foundation and one whose focus and dedication is to supporting entrepreneurs. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, where you think that came from and how it ultimately came to be? So the advice that, well, a couple of pieces of advice first. Um, and I should mention that, uh, during his lifetime, and certainly, you know, with decisions like baseball, those things wouldn't have happened without his wife Muriel at his side. And she was uh, she was from Toronto originally, grew up there, and uh, they met, they got married. She uh, was wanting to find a hobby or something that he could do. Baseball came along. She was probably a bigger baseball fan than than he was. In fact, after. Um, it's another fun fact I'll throw out there, but uh, after they were successful baseball owners, she was one of the owners that lobbied Major League Baseball to get a franchise in Toronto in her home. So for the <laughs> Blue Jays. So, um, but uh, forget where I was going with this now, but when he got to the point where he's going to give back, and I think baseball is a good segue to that because as I mentioned, it was his, introduction back into you know what can i do for this city that has given so much for me well baseball here's here's baseball um he um one of the things that struck him was when the team was out of town this big old stadium was empty at the same time they were promoting the idea that people should learn cpr so he opened up the stadiums on weekends and Thousands of people came and learned how to do CPR at, at Royal Stadium. And uh, this was a good place to have a health emergency because 125,000 people in Kansas City learned CPR at the stadium. And Mr. and Mrs. Kaufman were the National Red Cross men and women of the year that, that year after doing that. So he was looking for things like that to give back and then uh, talk to a lot of people, including critics of foundations. So there's a famous book, if you're in the world of philanthropy or foundations, philanthropic foundations called The Golden uh, Donors, D-O-N-O-R-S, uh, by Wally Nielsen. And so it was it's sort of an indictment of philanthropic foundations and how they move away from their mission and the founder's original intent. Donor intent is a huge thing for any foundation. You need to hold true to that, or you're supposed to. Um, and so this book was, you know, examples of when that did not happen. Ewing Kaufman called Wally Nielsen and said, what can I do to not make it into your next book? You know, and he not only did that, but he invited Wally to be on the board of the Kaufman Foundation. So uh, here we have this, this, this critic of foundations who's helping us figure out how we move forward. The advice that Ewing Kaufman got was twofold. One is don't start a family foundation. You know, you're passionate about certain things. Your wife is passionate about certain things. You have one foundation. Muriel has her foundation. Now, what's her foundation is about the arts and entertainment. And if you're in Kansas City or if you haven't been to Kansas City, I highly recommend including the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts downtown as part of that visit. And that's that's all Mrs. Kaufman's foundation. So uh, separate from our foundation. For Mr. Kaufman, his passion 
wasn't the arts or entertainment. Uh, it was the education he received and the chance to start his own business. Those were the moments when he looked at the span of his life and said, what changed the trajectory of my life? What gave me opportunities that I never imagined? And so the education, both in school and out of school, that you know, books provided that we talked about earlier, and then the chance to start his own business, the chance that that was even possible. And so he wanted to make those two things possible for other people. So that's our emphasis, education, entrepreneurship. Um, they sort of go hand in hand. And I'll, I'll tell you, Kevin, sometimes it feels like we make too big a deal about those are related. And we're like trying to point those out to people. It's like, yeah, education, entrepreneurship, education. I think the rest of the world knows that. <laughs> so <laughs> They don't need to be told by the Kauffman Foundation how a good education, especially one that prepares you in a real world learning way, which it feels like we're moving closer to in the way we pre prepare uh, kids for their future. Um, that, and, and part of then what they can do is to um, take control of their own destiny, you know, become an entrepreneur, uh, you know, take, you know, uh, make a job instead of take a job, all of the, you know, I had a chance to uh, to visit a, a unique kind of charter school, I guess you would call it, in Australia, in uh, Adelaide, or uh, Perth, Australia, in the western part of the country this summer. And so a, a mom had started it, along with another mom, but her son was really struggling in school, but a very entrepreneurial young guy, but kind of the whole idea of sitting still for a whole day just wasn't his thing. And so she's like, there has to be a better way to do it. And so she started this charter school for entrepreneurial young people where they still get the education, but not in such a prescribed, you know, a more customized way. But then they get half of the day to work on business ideas. They're in a startup incubator. So some of them go to work for older entrepreneurs that are there. But I thought, you know, it's not a high school for everyone, of course, but for entrepreneurial young people that oftentimes aren't built for school, especially when they're 15, 16, 17 years old. It was so cool. And they had this young guy come talk to us and he was doing something on social media. I don't know what, but he'd earned $30,000 the previous week. <laughs> you know, and it's like, how cool is that? So anyway, yeah, to your point, I think education and entrepreneurship always are together and intertwined. It's a curiosity led thing. You wonder what we've been missing as a society by losing kids at some point and uh you know and i you know I, I schools are vital uh you know but how we prepare kids for the world that's that's out there and to take advantage of uh their talents to and to sort of tap into their talents instead of pushing them down or something i mean to let those things blossom uh is uh something I think uh, can happen through entrepreneurship, whether it's through a structured thing in a school environment or out in the real world. Um, we've had some things, some successes in Kansas City with, you know, internships programs, intern programs where uh, kids get a chance to do something really meaningful, work on assignments within a company that really have meaning and they're paid internships, which is another thing we are really, uh, supportive of. And uh, so, you know, not everybody's going to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody should be an entrepreneur. And it's funny because when we were established as sort of a, a philanthropic foundation that focused on education entrepreneurship, there weren't a lot of people even talking about entrepreneurship or, or even using the term. And I remember the excitement around here when one, I, I can't remember which president during the State of the Union address use the term entrepreneur and how they create all the new job, the net new jobs are all created by entrepreneurs because the established companies get more productive by cutting people and entrepreneurs, you know, are gearing up and they need to hire people. And it was like, Oh, it's, that's great. I mean, they were citing, a, they were citing a Kaufman sponsored study, I think of job creation. I've, I've seen that. And that thing, that thing went all over the place. And, you know, to me, the beauty of it was, it was, 
it broke things down into a, a simple, understandable, you know, this is why, you know, we need more entrepreneurs. This is why we need to encourage it. Uh, the economic ramifications. So, Well, maybe to wrap up, um, you had talked about earlier the benefits that Mr. Kaufman had offered at Marion Laboratories and how if we looked at those today, there would be some important lessons there. And so for our entrepreneurs, our business owners, our innovators that are listening and watching, what <laughs> describe some of those benefits for us and how they are so striking for you to look at. I, you know, I should have familiarized myself with the chart more before I came up here, but, you know, I know they had deep discounts for all, all of their pharmaceuticals. They had, you know, amazing healthcare coverage. Um, they had a suggestion program that was sort of off the charts in terms of uh, rewards that were available. Uh, they would have regular Kaufman on the move meetings. And it's funny because we have photos where these Kaufman on the moves, one of my favorite photos of Mr. Kaufman, he's standing on the loading dock and there's all the, all the associates are spread out. It's outdoors. And this was one of the original Kaufman on the move meetings. They went from, well, the original Kaufman on the move were probably five guys having a beer after work on Troost Avenue. And then they kept growing and growing going to the loading dock eventually they were at the uh the arena or auditorium downtown where everybody would get on buses and go out and that's when they gave the awards for different ideas and famously you know somebody who was you know a security guard or a custodian or something would like make a suggestion and it was like yeah that's and then receive a, a significant check at one of these events the other thing, and this isn't listed on that frame thing, but it's something that people talk about. And you mentioned about how people have embraced Ewing Kaufman as Mr. K. I mean, I think it's because we've heard stories like this where Mr. Kaufman would find out something that you did on your job, Kevin, and he wouldn't write a letter to you. He would write a letter to your mom and dad and say, you know what? I work with Kevin. He's my associate and he did this project and I can't tell you how much big of an impact it made on our company. And it's not unusual when you talk to people like those letters got framed and put in a place of honor in somebody's house because Ewing Kaufman, you know, recognized the contribution that our son or our daughter made. He wrote letters to, uh, again, I, I came to the foundation after he was gone, but when I first came, there were people that work with him at the foundation. And uh, I remember Mike uh, Helmer, one of the, one of our associates, his son received a letter from Mr. Kaufman at one point and said, you know, your dad did this for the foundation. And I, I it just blows me away. And, you know, I, at, at some level, it seems simple, but it's so genuine and caring that um, it just, you know, it set him apart. Um, it probably shouldn't. We should probably be doing, I should be doing more of that. <laughs> well, I tell, I tell students, you know, uh, write little thank you notes and things like that and send them in the mail because it's so unusual today to get anything <laughs> interesting in the mail. And I know it seems a bit antiquated, but people won't forget when they get that nice note. So a great, great lesson there. Well, uh, treat people right, <laughs> share in the rewards. Uh, you know, no. it's funny because there is a, you know, biblical aspect to treat others as you want to be treated. You know, I thought, well, what, what is, is that, how does it connect with different religions? And it actually connects with every religion. I mean, I, I found this somewhere. It's it in the middle, it says the golden rule, but then it has uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Taoism, Christianity, Judaism, uh, Islam, and it has their passage for each of these belief systems that are basically saying, treat others as you want to be treated. So I don't know if, you know, no matter where you come from, no matter what your background is, um, you know, the lesson, that kind of lesson, um, 
or or maybe you just listen to maybe you just watch Mr. Rogers growing up, you know, and learn that, uh, you know, what it means to treat others as you want to be treated. I do think it's unusual that a business was founded on that principle uh, and especially that it was 1950 uh, when I mean, that was madman days. I mean, <laughs> there was, you know, and to think that somebody felt that strongly that this is the way I'm going to run my business. This is the principles I'm going to run it by. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to waver in that. So. Well, Matt, uh, thank you for taking the time to share. And thank you for everything you do at the Kauffman Foundation. You and your associates. I mean, you are, uh, you are sort of, uh, you've sort of broken down the two aspects. You've got the education and the entrepreneurship covered. So you're in the, uh, you're on the ground floor of what we're trying to accomplish. So thanks for everything that you do as well. Thank you.